Tonight we will talk about the Occupy movement on UNM's campus. Paul Nicklin joins us to talk about the event of the MMA Jackson Series at the Hard Rock Casino and Hotel. All this and more on U News. Hello and welcome to UNM News. The 99% movement has moved onto the UNM campus. The movement that began in early September is seeking to speak out against social and economic inequality and corporate greed has spread cross country and making a major presence on campuses everywhere. Joshua Huggins reports. The Occupy Wall Street movement has made its way onto UNM's campus. Occupy Albuquerque has called UNM home for about a month now, and there's little sign protesters plan on leaving anytime soon. Members have made makeshift tents and even have a kitchen set up to help keep a constant presence on campus. Occupy activist Jason Logan says the campus setting is a perfect platform for the movement and their message. Um, I think this would be a really good location, just being that you have the student body here, you figure you know the student body would get involved in something you know political and something like this where it is, you know, it really does involve everyone, so. Um. People from all walks of life have taken part in the protest. Activists say they have built their own small community, something that they hope their message will translate to the people of Albuquerque. We're really out here fighting for people's rights and liberties. Uh, we have a lot of college students that are involved. We have, you know, um, middle class, upper class, lesser class. Uh, I doubt there's really too much 1% in here. UNM alumni Erica Estes says the movement has much more to it than the message of the national platform. Estes says that education and the cost of education are the things that concern her most. Um, and I can only imagine my you know, peers across the country who have gone to schools who are much more expensive, um, who are going to be graduating you know, $100,000 in debt for undergraduate alone, to go out into the world and, and not find jobs that are you know, related to what they studied, that are um, fulfilling in a particular way, uh, which is only one aspect. Protesters plan on staying until a change is made, but with colder months ahead, this might present a challenge. This is Joshua Huggins reporting. Campus reporter Baron Jones also spoke with supporters of the movement. For more than three weeks, protesters have used UNM's Yale Park as a command post for Occupy Wall Street Albuquerque. The activists here in Yale Park and the rest of the nation are protesting the government's inadequate response to issues ranging from the economy to the environment. Protester Hanny Barjot, who was jailed during the second week of protests, explained the discontent people have with the job market. Work more for less. They want people to work at an older age with less insurance that they will have a 401k when they retire. And the divide between the rich and the poor is getting bigger and bigger. You're either in on the high paying jobs with these big corporations, with a federal job, with the state, with the county, or you're not. And in order to get in on that system, you have to act a certain way, you have to talk a certain way, and you have to play the game. University of New Mexico labor specialist Richard Santos says changes to the U.S. manufacturing sector have created a situation where more and more Americans are struggling to make ends meet. It's always been an issue. It's been so-called working poor people that are that are earning basically the minimum wage and, and are at that level. That's close to being subsistence wages. And that's a very difficult situation to be in without health insurance and other things. The, the thing that, 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 that that's... I mean, that, that's a problem in itself, but then the problem has been compounded because you no longer just have the working poor, but now it's going into the high school graduates, those who are traditionally held maybe manufacturing jobs, those jobs are gone, and so they're getting pushed more into that sort of uh, working poor, uh, low-wage sector that without any real hopes of having health insurance, retirement, or other kinds of benefits. So. Albuquerque resident Leon Toledo says although he isn't too familiar with the protesters' complaints, he says he is tired of being broke after being out of a job for over four months. All I know is, is that there's lack of jobs and stuff, and it's just really hard to find jobs nowadays. Despite, like, right now I'm trying to get like what I can get, even though it's fast food or whatever. This is Baron Jones reporting from Yale Park for U News. 
Recently, the University of New Mexico decided not to extend the permit of the Occupy movement at Yale Park. Administrators made the decision after a man with a knife threatened protesters and after reports of a registered sex offender among the activists. Supporters of the movement were removed after 10 p.m. on Tuesday, October 25th. The New Mexico State Legislature finished their 21-day not-so-special session last month. Finishing little redistricting work, Republican Governor Susana Martinez will veto two Democratic-backed maps out of the four redistricting maps that made it to her desk. Earlier today, I spoke with Adriana Sanchez, who covered the GOP Hispanic Leadership Conference here in Albuquerque. I'm here with Adriana Sanchez, who is a UNM MBA student and an award-winning journalist. How are you? Fine, Sophia. How are you? Good. So I wanted to ask you about this conference and why do you think the GOP is concentrating on the Latino population, especially with this upcoming election? Well, um, Sophia, one thing that we need to remember is that the Hispanic population is growing tremendously. Uh, if we look at the numbers from 2000 to 2010, the Hispanic population grew 43%, which is around 50 million. And most of the uh, growth is by birth rate. So that means that all of the, um, there's gonna be a, a huge population of Latinos that are, that are gonna be able to vote. So the GOP has to reach to the Latino community in order for them to, to remain in power. And how do you think that New Mexico is going to gain national attention with our Governor Susana Martinez, who's the first Latina governor? What do you think that means for us? Well, it means that uh, New Mexico is going to become one of the states that will get uh, a lot of uh, national attention, in my opinion, because uh, Susana Martinez is the first Latina to ever be governor in the history of this country. So that uh, means that um, everybody will be looking at uh, New Mexico. The other thing is that New Mexico is a border state. And with the immigration um, issues that are coming up, um, people will be looking to see if the licenses uh, remain available for everybody, or if, in fact, um, New Mexico will follow the lead of other states that are, are revoking licenses for undocumented immigrants. And with Hispanics, trying to take the forefront in the GOP and trying to gain the Hispanic vote. A lot of um, Hispanic politicians are playing up on their heritage. You were telling me about Mark Rubio from Florida, mm -hmm. who is having a little difficulty doing that now. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, one of the things that is going on uh, with Senator Rubio from Florida is that um, there's been some allegations that in his website, he wrote that his family came to the United States uh, after Castro uh, took power, when in fact uh, his family came to the United States before uh, Castro took power. So the exile community um, is questioning if this is true or not. So um, the other, um, so situations like that are, are coming up and I think that will open the door for Susana Martinez to be uh, a rising, rising star in the, in the Republican Party. And if you could just speak a little bit about the goals that this conference was leading upon on gaining the Hispanic vote, what are they going after with Hispanic? I think uh, one thing that is really important for them is to try to find a way to connect with the Hispanic community because right now uh, the immigration um, situation is causing them to, to have some kind of disconnection with the Hispanic community because when you talk about immigration, you're not only, only talking about uh, somebody who comes to the U.S. without documents. You're also talking about somebody whose mother could be undocumented. And so I feel that they're trying to find a way to appeal to the Latino community without, um, without alienating the general population that may be against uh, undocumented uh, immigration or other issues that are important for the Latino community. All right, well, thank you, Adriana, for giving us your take on the GOP leadership conference, and we look forward to seeing what's going to happen in this next election. So sure. thank you. Thank you.
This past weekend, Jackson's MMA series held an event at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. One up and coming fighter stood out among the rest. Paul Nicklin and Adam Ornelas report. Here at Jackson's MMA Series 6, local fighter Matt Leva was prepared for the toughest fight of his career. The stakes are huge, you know. Uh, he's coming in from California. He has nothing to lose. This is, this is my venue, my city, you know, my state. This is my team, everything. We're going to go fight. That's my cage we're in. You know, uh, he is referring to Federico Lopez, a product of King Quest from California and his opponent in the co-main event. Levan Lopez spent the first two rounds fighting at a high intensity, sprawling numerous times and using the entire octagon. For Levan, it has been a week to remember, as he welcomed a second daughter into the world and finished his last class for a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Leva had the hometown advantage, and as the fight progressed, his fan base became louder and louder. During the third round, Lopez cut Leva's nose open, but the cut was not enough, as the judges scored a unanimous decision for Leva in a hotly contested battle. Leva improved his record to 8-2. and two. Now joining us on the UNM News set is the correspondent from the MMA event at the Hard Rock, Paul Nicklin. Paul, good to see you this evening. Good to see you too. Now tell me about this event and how it affected Matt Leva. Um, well, Matt Leva came off what might be one of the greatest weeks of anyone's life of all time. Uh, he, had, he had a newborn baby, a uh, new daughter. Uh, he won what was probably the biggest fight of his career, and he finished up his degree in criminal justice. Wow. And in that, he also beat Federico Lopez, who is a Team Quest product, and Team Quest is a top five gym in the United States. So a busy and successful week for him. Absolutely. Now tell me about the, the group that he's associated with, Jackson's. How was Jackson's affected by this fight? How did they do collectively with the team? Well, they, they were the ones that showcased the fight. So um, each fight had one of their fighters in the fight against another opponent. Uh, Jackson's won 6-2, and 3-0 and oh in amateur competition, and both of their co-main eventers won, Leva being one, and Joey Villasenor beating Chuck Parmley in the other one. Now tell me about the attendance at the event and how it affects Albuquerque and MMA in the future. The, we don't have the exact numbers for it, but that play, uh, the Hard Rock was booming. There were a lot of people there. It was either a sold out show or a nearly, nearly sold out show. And uh, if they don't have another event in Albuquerque for Jackson's MMA series, they, they're missing out because it's a really, really worthy investment. And what do you think the possibility is of getting the big UFC to come to Albuquerque for a fight? Um, it, it's going to happen eventually. The more, the more shows that come to Albuquerque in the New Mexico area, the more people start watching it live. And um, they've already had a WEC event here, and WEC has been bought out by the UFC. So they have had a track record of coming to New Mexico and hosting shows. All right. Well, thank you very much, Paul. And we look forward to more of your correspondence. And uh, we'll be back right after this. Something not quite as old as the Rio Grande rivalry, but many would say is more impressive than the game itself between the University of New Mexico and New Mexico State. Adam Camp caught up with Eric Savini and Troy Wells of the UNM Army ROTC department and stumbled upon a marathon of an event. Starting a couple days ago, the uh, ROTC program from New Mexico State started running the football halfway from Las Cruces to Albuquerque. At the halfway point, uh, the UNM R Army ROTC program met up with them and we relayed it the other half. And uh, here we are, this is the, the final stretch of the run. We're gonna run it out onto the field and bring it to the ref. Troy Wells, a junior and first sergeant, the top position for a junior in the UNM Army ROTC department, runs the ball on the field before the Rio Grande rivalry between UNM and NMSU. You may be wondering how this started. 
Former head of the UNM Army ROTC Department and Army recruiter Eric Savini explains. On a whim, uh, we were sitting at Fort Lewis, Washington, my counterpart and I, and we said, hey, let's uh, get involved with the Rio Grande rivalry. Savini also explained why Cadet Wells was chosen for the specific honor. Our top cadets uh, get chosen or selected to uh, actually run the ball onto the field. And this year, uh, Troy is one of our top junior cadets. Wells had a humbled response to being chosen for the honor of running the ball onto the field. I, I kind of got picked by my cadre. Uh, it was part of just my, my position in ROTC and just kind of volunteering for a lot of stuff and kind of being on their good side. So after 323 miles on I-25 from Las Cruces to Albuquerque, the football finally made it into the hands of the referee and the game could begin. For UNM News, I'm Adam Camp. That concludes this edition of UNM News. For Sophia Sanchez and me, Adam Camp, have a wonderful evening.